Amitabha, from the Sutra, the five roots, the five powers. Root means being able to sustain and grow. As the five roots are cultivated, the five powers are nurtured and strengthened. Doubt is dissolved, and virtues are successfully developed. The five roots are like a tree growing. Early on, it's a seedling with shallow, undeveloped roots. Over time, it grows into a sapling, and eventually into a tree able to withstand the fiercest storms. Just like that seedling, the five powers will likewise become stronger. Both the five roots and the five powers have the same components. Belief, diligence, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. The first root, belief, gives rise to the diligence root. The diligence root gives rise to the mindfulness root. The mindfulness root gives rise to the concentration root, which gives rise to the fifth root, wisdom. These five roots then develop into the five powers, with the wisdom root generating the first power, belief. The deeper and stronger the roots, the deeper and stronger the powers. Since all five powers arise from the wisdom root, The wisdom root nurtures the five powers. The first of the five roots and the five powers is belief. It is the foundation of our practice and one of the three requisites for birth in the Western Pure Land. Belief is to be confident and not to have any doubt. We believe in our practice of chanting the name of Amitabha Buddha, knowing that it is the right practice for us. We also believe in our support practices, for example, the ten virtuous karmas and the six paramitas. Ultimately, belief in the Pure Land method will help us transcend the cycle of rebirth. We can learn about the importance of belief through an account of Master Dishian, the 43rd Patriarch of the Tiantai School and his old friend who wanted to become a monk. They became friends when they were children, even though they came from different backgrounds. The educated Master Dishian came from a well-to-do family, while his friend was illiterate and came from an impoverished family. When the friend grew up, he had a difficult life, mending broken pots and dishes. Every day, he carried his tools on a pole as he walked around town, struggling to earn some money. One day, he went to visit his childhood friend, Master Dishian, who had by then become a monk. After staying at the monastery for a few days, he told the master, I want to become a monk. Why? asked the master. Life is filled with suffering. I really must become a monk, the friend replied. The master said, Don't joke with me. Just stay here for a few days and then go back to your work. Why wouldn't the master let him become a monk? Because he thought that his friend, now in his forties, was too old to adjust to the rigors of monastic life. The training would be too difficult for him. As to chanting the sutras or learning to lecture on them, he couldn't read. If he lived in the monastery, others would look down on him. It would all be too difficult. Therefore, the master denied his friend's request. But the friend persisted. No, I have to become a monk. I don't want to mend pots anymore. The master was now in a quandary. Recalling their close childhood friendship, he finally said to his friend, 
If you're sure that you want to become a monk, you have to agree to my conditions first. The friend replied, No problem. You are my teacher. I will accept whatever you say. The master said, Very well. I will tonsor you, but you will not take the monastic precepts because the 53 days of formal training will be too difficult for you. Nor will you live in this monastery afterward. There are many small deserted temples in the countryside. I will find one for you to stay in. Master Dishan then arranged for some local lay practitioners to see to his friend's basic needs. An elderly woman was found to cook for him and do his laundry. The master told the new monk, Just chant Amitabha Buddha's name. When you are tired, take a rest. When rested, resume chanting. Persevere with the chanting, and you will surely benefit from this in the future. The uneducated monk sincerely followed the master's teaching. A rare student, indeed. Dedicating himself solely to his mindful chanting, he did not leave the temple for three years. Then one day he went out to visit his friends and relatives. Upon returning to the temple, he told the woman who cooked for him, There is no need to prepare food for me tomorrow. She thought to herself, He hasn't left here for three years. Today he went to visit his friends. Maybe his friends invited him to a meal tomorrow, and that's why he told me not to cook. The next day the woman went to the temple around noon to see if the monk had returned. After calling out to him and receiving no reply, she went into the temple to look for him. Finding him standing upright, his chanting beads in his hand, she again called out. But still he did not respond. Moving closer to him, she realized that he was dead. He had died while standing, chanting the Buddha name. The woman was astounded. She had never seen anything like this in her life. Bewildered, she rushed off to tell the others who also looked after the monk. Not knowing what to do either, they sent a messenger to notify Master Dishian. It was three days before the master arrived at the temple. When he saw the still-standing monk, he announced admiringly, your becoming a monk has borne fruit. Not one of the Dharma masters or abbots at any of the famous temples and monasteries can match your achievement. The monk had focused on chanting the name of Amitabha Buddha. After just three years, he was born in the Pure Land. After he died, he was still standing. He did not die of illness, and in fact, knew in advance when he was going to pass on. His success was due in no small part to his unwavering belief. The second of both the five roots and the five powers is diligence. Diligently applying ourselves to our primary practice enables us to make focused progress. As we begin to see some results, we will enjoy the practice and not tire of it. Diligence can also be applied successfully to everything we do. Whether chanting, working, or completing other activities, we do so steadily. When it is appropriate, we take a break. After a reasonable time, we return to our task. If we keep striving and are always diligent, we will eliminate our habit of laziness, initially in everyday duties, ultimately in our Buddhist practice. Looking at the 37 limbs, we see that diligence appears several times. 
If we wish to be born in the pure land, we must be diligent in our daily practice. For without diligence, our roots will remain shallow and our powers weak. The third of the five roots and the five powers is mindfulness, which will improve with our diligence. Mindfulness means keeping in mind, keeping both the primary practice and the supplemental means in mind. As Buddha name chanting practitioners, our most important practice is to keep the name of Amitabha Buddha always in mind, using the name to check our wandering thoughts, discriminations, and attachments. The fourth of the five roots and five powers is concentration, a focused mind. This is the mind that no longer seeks externally, for it knows that everything we need is already within us. By focusing our mind on chanting the name of Amitabha Buddha, we will reach the state where we are continuously aware of him. At that point, there will be no need to worry about how to act. With our mind focused on Amitabha's name, we will react from our true nature and do what is right naturally. Amitabha Buddha is the root of our concentration in the Pure Land Dharma door. Our every thought should accord with Amitabha and with the Pure Land teachings. As it is said, when one accords with Amitabha Buddha in one thought, one is Amitabha Buddha in that thought. And when one accords with Amitabha Buddha in every thought, one is Amitabha Buddha in every thought. The fifth of the five roots and five powers is wisdom. As we have seen, the first root, belief, leads to the root of diligence, then to the root of mindfulness, then of concentration, and finally of wisdom. The root of wisdom, in turn, leads to and nurtures the five powers. Wisdom can eliminate all doubts and improper beliefs, help us overcome our afflictions, and uncover our true nature. It enables us to naturally know the difference between true and false, proper and deviated, right and wrong, beneficial and harmful. With wisdom, we will thoroughly comprehend everything we encounter, knowing how to interact appropriately with things and situations. When our wisdom has deep roots, we will not waver we will be firm and unshakable. When the five roots grow into the five powers, these powers will enable us to help not only ourselves, but others as well. From the Sutra, The Seven Factors of Enlightenment In our practice of the 37 limbs of enlightenment, the five roots and the five powers are followed by the seven factors of enlightenment. These factors help us know how to prevent obstacles from arising in our practice. The first factor of enlightenment is mindfulness. Mindfulness enables us to know real from false and helps us distinguish between what are genuine needs and what are simply desires. With this awareness, we will then know what we should pursue as opposed to what we typically pursue, the five desires of wealth, sex, fame, food, and sleep. In foolishly chasing these desires, we ignore the second of the four foundations of mindfulness, Mindfulness of feelings as suffering. Failing to grasp the cause of suffering, 
we set ourselves up for even more suffering. Desiring wealth, we become frustrated when we feel that we do not have enough. Longing for fame, we feel irritated when others do not praise us in the way we want. Craving a particular food, we feel disappointed when it fails to satisfy us in the way we expect. Such endless desires and our resultant feelings are all wandering, pointless thoughts. We pursue things of this world, forgetting that they are illusory and temporary, not real and lasting. When we realize that everything in the cycle of rebirth is an illusion, we will come to understand that impermanent, worldly phenomena cannot go with us when we die. The only thing that will go with us is our karma. We must strive, therefore, to accomplish good karmas and avoid committing those that are bad. Having the wisdom to tell real from false, this is being mindful. The second factor of enlightenment is the correct choice of teaching. This factor addresses the need to evaluate correctly the teachings that are available so that we can choose the method that is best suited to our abilities and conditions. For example, drawn to Buddhism, we have evaluated the teachings and picked the Pure Land method of learning and practice. Now, as students of the Pure Land School, we need to choose our teacher. This accomplished, we need to learn how to practice from him or her so that we can progress in the right direction. The third factor of enlightenment is diligence, the tireless striving to attain a goal. Usually, we are enthusiastic when we choose to begin a new endeavor. But, as is often the case, this enthusiasm wanes after a while. If we are not careful, this can also happen with our practice. There is a saying that in the first year of learning Buddhism, a Buddha is right in front of us. In the second year, he is on the distant horizon. In the third year, he is off in the clouds. All too easily, our interest dwindles. If this happens, then even learning and practicing Buddhism can become mindless routine. But if we are able to maintain our original enthusiasm and sincerity for learning Buddhism, Buddhahood will surely be achieved. The fourth factor of enlightenment is joy. Dharma joy is peaceful and pure. Once we have tasted the flavor of the Dharma, there will be no stopping us. During our learning and chanting, we will feel real joy, a sign that we are making courageous and diligent progress. The fifth factor of enlightenment is ease, which enables our mind to become stable and calm. To accomplish this, we need to know how to rid ourselves of afflictions. Afflictions quickly arise when we are affected by our surroundings and frustrated in the face of difficulties. It is very easy to reach this point where we just want to give up. Instead of being troubled and wanting to abandon our practice, we need to delve more deeply into it. We do so by initially using our Buddha name chanting to master our afflictions and then to eliminate them. 
when our chanting is firmly entrenched, we will naturally be neither angry in adverse conditions nor attached to pleasant ones. The sixth factor of enlightenment is concentration. The goal of concentration in our practice is to uncover our true nature. As Buddhists, we need single-minded concentration. We achieve this by delving deeply into one method and being immersed in it for a long time. We should not try to learn various methods. Trying to succeed by learning many methods is like trying to arrive at a destination by taking different routes, all at the same time. If we concentrate on our practice of chanting Amitabha Buddha's name and resist the temptation to learn other methods, we will be able to achieve constant mindfulness. In this state, we will no longer have thoughts stemming from selfishness, greed, anger, ignorance, or arrogance. We will no longer crave wealth, sex, fame, food, and sleep. We will not have eliminated these afflictions, but we will be able to keep them in check. At that time, we will be continuously aware of Amitabha Buddha. But if we are intrigued by many things and want to learn as much as we can from them, we will make little progress in reaching constant mindfulness. In the end, we may learn much, but will achieve little. Clearly, this is not what we want to happen. We need to remember that the key to success in all undertakings is single-minded concentration. The seventh factor of enlightenment is equanimity. Not yet having attained equanimity, we usually find ourselves tempted by external stimuli. Our senses will be aroused by these stimuli, and we will react to them. But we should not be attached to them. When they are gone, we should not yearn for them. Every time we reminisce about them, a seed is planted in our store consciousness as we create yet another karmic cause. Although our speech and actions may not be creating a karmic cause, our thoughts are. We should remember that all phenomena are illusory and all conditioned existences are like a dream, an illusion, a bubble, a shadow. We need to turn to these seven factors of enlightenment when we encounter problems in our learning and practice. They can help us determine the right method to prevent more obstacles from arising. If we feel sleepy, or for whatever reason cannot be mindful of Amitabha, we can use mindfulness, diligence, and joy to aid us in selecting the most suitable practice. For example, after doing sitting meditation for a while, we may switch to prostrations or walking meditation. Or, if we think that the chanting is tedious, we can think of the beautiful aspects of the Pure Land, how everything there glows with light, how soft the golden ground is, or how beautifully the birds sing. Alternatively, should we feel agitated or become distracted by external stimuli, we can practice ease, concentration, and equanimity to calm ourselves. We can think of how Amitabha gave rise to extraordinary compassion and made his great vows for our benefit and then encourage ourselves to be more like him. 
We can think of someone whose practice we admire and respect and try to be more like that person. Or we can remind ourselves how content we are when we sincerely practice. These are just some of the ways we can overcome obstacles in our practice and thus continue to move forward on the path to enlightenment. From the Sutra, The Eightfold Path, as well as other teachings. The five roots, the five powers, and the seven factors of enlightenment are explained in general terms and, being non-specific to any school, they apply to both Theravada and Mahayana Buddhism. The explanations for the Eightfold Path, however, differ slightly between the two branches in regards to both the principles and the practice. The Eightfold Path has eight components, each of which includes right. Right means with true wisdom. This is the wisdom that has never been tainted by wandering thoughts, discriminations, and attachments. When wisdom is mingled with selfishness, greed, anger, ignorance, or arrogance, then everything we think, say, and do becomes tainted and thus wrong. No more true wisdom. No more right. The first component of the Eightfold Path is right view. Right view is the correct outlook on life and the universe. To have right view, we need to clearly understand the Four Noble Truths. The Four Truths are composed of two sets of cause and effect, in which the effect precedes its cause. The first set, cause and effect at the worldly level, consists of the first and second truths, the existence of suffering and the cause of suffering. The second set, cause and effect at the supramundane level, consists of the third and fourth truths, the end of suffering and the path that leads to the end of suffering. If we are clear about the principles taught in the sutras, are clear about causes and effects of the universe, we will have right view. Additionally, in the Pure Land School, the standard for right is to be always mindful of Amitabha Buddha as we strive to be born in the Pure Land. Right view is to believe without a doubt that Amitabha Buddha and the magnificent environment in the Western Pure Land are just as Sakyamuni Buddha introduced them in the sutras. Clearly, our right view does not come from seeing the Western Pure Land with our own eyes. It comes from our belief in the sutras, which were spoken by Sakyamuni Buddha. We believe in Sakyamuni, knowing he would not lie to us. We believe that every word Sakyamuni spoke is true. We base our right view on the Pure Land Sutras and our wholehearted belief in their teachings. The second component of the Eightfold Path is right thought. All thoughts should arise from a mind free of attachments and afflictions. In the Pure Land School, right thought is Amitabha Buddha. When we are not thinking about Amitabha and the Western Pure Land, we have wandering thoughts, thoughts that continually keep us undergoing the karmic retribution of endless rebirths. We should transform the thoughts and karmas that hold us in samsara to the pure thoughts and karmas of the Western Pure Land. 
we should think about the Pure Land. Think about Amitabha Buddha and all that he has done to provide us with the ideal environment for learning and practice. This is right thought for Pure Land Buddhists. The third component in the Eightfold Path is right speech. Right speech includes not using speech that is false, divisive, harsh, or enticing. It is to speak in a way that is of benefit to those listening. It is to choose the words to be spoken very carefully. In the Pure Land School, right speech is Amitabha. We greet people with Amitabha. When someone calls our name, we reply, Amitabha. When we respond to an email or a text, we write, Amitabha. This is our right speech. We constantly keep Amitabha Buddha in mind. The fourth component in the Eightfold Path is right action. Right action includes no killing, no stealing, no sexual misconduct. It is to act without attaching to anything and to be careful of one's behavior, making sure it is proper. It is to act without intermingled, wandering thoughts of selfishness, discrimination, or attachment. In the Pure Land School, right action consists of three distinct karmic actions. They are thinking about Amitabha Buddha, which is a mental activity, chanting the name of Amitabha Buddha, which is a verbal action, and paying respect to Amitabha Buddha, which is a physical action. These are the three right actions of the Pure Land School. The fifth component is right livelihood. The sutras speak of right livelihood as avoiding occupations that harm others. For example, not dealing in the trading of human beings or the production and sale of weapons, animals, intoxicants, or poisons. Essentially, right livelihood is to work in a way that respects the environment and all the beings in it. To have a livelihood that benefits others is best. If this is not possible, then the goal should be, at the very least, to do no harm. In the Pure Land School, right livelihood, our true work, is mindfully chanting the name of Amitabha Buddha for the rest of our life and practicing according to the Pure Land teachings. It is setting examples for others with our mental, verbal, and physical actions by living in a way that will aid and not harm others. The sixth component is right effort. Right effort is to be diligent in cultivating a virtuous, pure mind. This cultivation can be accomplished through the four right efforts, preventing new evil from arising, ending existing evil, generating new virtues, and enhancing existing virtues. Right effort also enables one to determine what is worthwhile. It is to maintain one's health, to be joyful, and not push to do what is beyond one's abilities. In the Pure Land School, right effort is to delve deeply into our Dharma door and to diligently immerse ourselves in it for a long time. We should strive to achieve constant mindfulness, which will allow us to control our wandering thoughts, afflictions, and residual habits. In this state, although we will not yet have eradicated our afflictions and residual habits, they will no longer arise. 
The seventh component is right mindfulness. One should be mindful in all actions, avoiding those that are bad and doing only those that are good. Right mindfulness lies at the heart of the other seven components of the Eightfold Path. One's views, thoughts, speech, actions, livelihood, effort, and concentration cannot be right if one is not mindful, not focused on what one is currently thinking and doing. In the Pure Land School, our principal practice in right mindfulness is generating the Bodhi mind and concentrating on mindfully chanting the Buddha name. Additionally, we have supplemental means of practice. These help us end all wrongdoings and perform good deeds and accumulate merits and cultivate virtues. We dedicate these merits and virtues to help us be born in the Western Pure Land. We accomplish these good deeds, virtues, and merits by practicing the five precepts, the ten virtuous karmas, the six paramitas, and the initial components of the 37 limbs of enlightenment. All of these will help us end our residual habits and afflictions, strengthen our belief and vow, and single-mindedly make unadulterated progress. This is right mindfulness. The eighth component is right concentration. Right concentration is to practice one Dharma door for the rest of one's life and not to keep switching to other methods. In the Pure Land School, right concentration is focusing on Amitabha Buddha. When our Buddha name chanting is efficacious, we will keep our afflictions and residual habits in check. Through our belief, vow, and chanting, we will remain focused and unshaken. We will have established the initial achievement level of our practice, constant mindfulness of Amitabha Buddha. The 37 limbs of enlightenment can differ from school to school. How each of us understands and practices them depends on our karmic roots. Just as these roots determine which school we gravitate to and practice. Regardless of the school we choose, we need to remember that everything in the cycle of rebirth is an illusion. We do not want to be misled by our personal views. And so, we need to attentively practice the first three major components of the 37 limbs of enlightenment. The four foundations of mindfulness, the four right efforts, and the four bases of supranormal abilities. As we progress, we will find that we have fewer wandering thoughts, discriminations, and attachments. We will then be able to practice the latter limbs of enlightenment, the five roots, the five powers, the seven factors of enlightenment, and the eightfold path. It is extraordinarily difficult to accomplish all components of the seven limbs of enlightenment in one lifetime, given that we practice them in sequential order. It would be an incredible achievement for us to complete every one of them in our all-too-brief human life. This is why transcending the cycle of rebirth through the practice of methods other than Pure Land is so difficult. The Pure Land Method has a rare advantage. It is the easiest to practice. But many find this fact difficult to believe. If we fulfill the three requisites of belief, vow, and practice, 
then as our practice of the 37 limbs in the Pure Land deepens, we will accomplish them all. In other words, by concentrating on the name of Amitabha Buddha, we will complete all the 37 limbs of enlightenment. From the Sutra When sentient beings in this land hear the singing of the birds, they become mindful of the Buddhas, mindful of the Dharma, mindful of the Sangha. Sakyamuni Buddha explained that as they listen to the birds' Dharma talks, the beings in the Pure Land become mindful of the Buddha, mindful of the Dharma, and mindful of the Sangha. Here in Samsara, we also strive to be mindful. When we take the three refuges, we are being mindful of the Buddha, of the Dharma, and of the Sangha. To be mindful of the Buddha is to return from delusion and rely upon awareness and understanding. Awareness, enlightenment, and the pure mind are the principles underlying all schools of Buddhism. We should always reflect, asking ourselves if our mental, verbal, and physical karmas reflect what the Buddha taught. Being mindful of the Dharma is to return from erroneous views and rely upon proper views and understanding. We should ask ourselves if our thoughts are proper. Do they accord with what is in the sutras? We depend on these teachings because we cannot depend on our personal viewpoints. Being mindful of the Sangha is to return from pollution and disharmony and rely upon purity of mind and the six principles of harmony. Here, we ask ourselves if our mind is pure, free of afflictions and wandering thoughts. Is our life one of harmony, or is it one of discord? If the latter, we can use the six principles of harmony as guidelines in our interactions with others in our workplace, our family, and our Sangha. If we are sincerely mindful of the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, then we have accepted the teachings and have indeed taken the three refuges. If, however, we continue to hold our same improper understanding then we have not accepted, have not internalized the teachings, but have only gone through the formality of taking part in a ceremony. From the Sutra Do not think that these birds were born as birds due to karmic retribution for past misdeeds. Why not? In this Buddha land, the three evil planes of existence do not exist. In this Buddha land, even the names of the evil planes of existence do not exist, much less the realities. All these birds are the creations of Amitabha Buddha, fashioned in order to sing the sounds of the Dharma. Next, Sakyamuni Buddha spoke to Sariputra, about how birds in the Pure Land are not like those in our world. Here, due to their past karmas, birds are reborn in the three evil planes of existence. Why are the planes, also known as paths, called evil? In Buddhism, evil refers to things that hold beings back from acting from their Buddha nature, their true nature. Thus, calling something evil is not saying it is bad or immoral, nor is it saying that individual beings in these paths are evil. On the contrary, since all beings have Buddha nature, the beings in these three paths are fundamentally good. 
Understanding this, consider the roots of the three evil paths, greed, anger, and ignorance. These three are so destructive that they are called the three poisons. Greed is the cause that results in rebirth in the hungry ghost path. Anger is the cause that results in rebirth in the hell path. Ignorance is the cause of rebirth in the animal path. These three poisons, which sentient beings experience in samsara, hold us back from attaining our goal of enlightenment and of helping others. It is very different in the pure land. Since the three evil paths do not exist in that land, we can see that the birds are not there because of karmic consequences. As Sakyamuni Buddha said, all these birds are the creations of Amitabha Buddha, fashioned in order to sing the sounds of the Dharma. Why did Amitabha create the birds? Beings in the Pure Land come from worlds where they enjoyed listening to birds sing. Knowing this, Amitabha compassionately created birds that sing the teachings. These birds, however, are found only in the land where sages and ordinary beings dwell together, the land described in the Amitabha Sutra. Of the four different lands comprising the Pure Land, the land where sages and ordinary beings dwell together is the one where most beings are born. Since these beings have not yet eliminated their worldly habits, many of them still have the habit of enjoying the sounds of birds singing. But unlike the songs of the birds in Samsara, the songs of the birds in the Pure Land are truly wondrous, for they are songs of the Dharma. Additionally, as great master O.E. wrote, by making us realize that we should not think of these birds in a pejorative way, it counters our tendency to make arbitrary distinctions. Amitabha Buddha, knowing that we usually view animals as inferior to humans, was gently teaching us not to look down on others. All of us have planted the seeds to be reborn as animals. But animals, at least, are repaying their karmic debts. We humans are still creating them. As Sakyamuni Buddha said in the Surangama Sutra, a human dies and becomes a sheep. A sheep dies and becomes a human. We should therefore be thankful for our good fortune and never look down on other beings, considering them inferior. Remember, we are all in samsara. And where we are within samsara depends entirely on our karma. All the birds in the Pure Land are singing the Dharma simultaneously. Wouldn't the sound of these teachings all at once be chaotic? No. We will only hear the teaching we wish to. For example, you and I are sitting next to each other in the Pure Land. I want to learn about the Amitabha Sutra, so I will hear a teaching on the Amitabha Sutra. You, on the other hand, may want to learn about the Infinite Life Sutra. So, you will hear a teaching on the Infinite Life Sutra. Amazing! This individualized education is as stated in Buddhism. The Buddha speaks one teaching, but the listeners understand it according to their capacities. And so, among the myriad teachings of the Dharma that the Buddha speaks, we will hear our chosen teaching, 
and understand that teaching according to our capacity. From all this, we can see that Amitabha Buddha is a compassionate teacher, patiently guiding us. He ensures that we will hear the teaching that we are ready for and happy to learn. From the Sutra In this Buddha land, there is a slight breeze that stirs the rows of jewel trees and jewel netting, so that they emit subtle, wondrous sounds, like hundreds and thousands of melodies playing all at once. All those who hear these sounds spontaneously become mindful of the Buddha, mindful of the Dharma, and mindful of the Sangha. In the previous passage, the sutra spoke of sentient beings singing the sounds of the Dharma. In this passage, it tells how even non-sentient beings can teach. Sakyamuni Buddha explained that the breezes rustling the trees produce musical sounds, which, in resonance with the being's calm, pure minds, becomes the most beautiful melodies. Altogether, the instruments, thousands and thousands of them, sound like they are playing a wondrous symphony. All the beings who listen to the music naturally become mindful of the Buddha, mindful of the Dharma, and mindful of the Sangha. In other words, the beings give rise to enlightenment, proper understanding, and purity of mind, respectively. How different this is from our world, where people remain mired in delusion, misunderstanding, and impure thoughts. There is no enlightenment, no proper understanding, no purity of mind. Thus, unlike the beings in the Pure Land, our minds can produce winds so fierce that they drive those hearing them to feel terrified. From all this, we can see that even the environment in the Western Pure Land encourages the beings there to improve their Bodhi mind. In our world called endurance, by contrast, the environment is filled with constant distractions that only intensify our greed, anger, and ignorance. As ordinary people, we are easily affected by our surroundings. So we should choose the best environment for our practice. This is why Sakyamuni Buddha encouraged us to strive to be born in the Pure Land. From the Sutra This Buddha Land is complete with all these adornments and virtues. Sakyamuni Buddha again told Sariputra that the Pure Land is wonderfully adorned. These adornments do not just flow from Amitabha Buddha's vows and practice. They also flow from our mindfulness of his name and from our true nature. Therefore, we should never think that we are not good enough or fortunate enough to enjoy such incredible things. At the other extreme, we should not be overly confident imagining that we will assuredly be born in a pure land in this lifetime. We still need to follow the three requisites, have firm belief, vow to be born in the pure land, and practice diligently. From the Sutra What do you think? Why is this Buddha called Amitabha? Why did Sakyamuni Buddha introduce Amitabha Buddha in the Pure Land? Because Amitabha is an excellent teacher for us. We can practice this Pure Land method and be confident that when we do it correctly, we will be able to attain Buddhahood in just one lifetime. Furthermore, 
people in our world have a strong affinity with Amitabha. Drawn to him by this affinity, we are happy to learn from him, glad to chant his name. And so Sakyamuni Buddha introduced this method to us. As great master Oe wrote in his commentary on the Amitabha Sutra, this sutra expressly teaches the wonderful practice of mindful Buddha name chanting, so it makes a special point of explaining this name. This is to enable people to deeply believe that this great name, which is endowed with myriad virtues, is inconceivable, so that they would single-mindedly chant the Buddha name with no more doubts. We must first understand that the most important teaching in this sutra is that we should mindfully chant Amitabha Buddha's name. Chanting is the easiest and simplest, the most convenient, and the most wondrous of the four forms of the Buddha mindfulness practice. The four forms are Buddha mindfulness based on real mark, Buddha mindfulness by contemplation of an image, Buddha mindfulness by visualization, and Buddha mindfulness by Buddha name chanting. The Amitabha Sutra advocates the fourth form, Buddha name chanting, as does the Infinite Life Sutra. These sutras attest to the profound significance of the name Amitabha Buddha. For these reasons, Sakyamuni emphasized the name by asking Sariputra why he thought this Buddha is called Amitabha. From the Sutra The light of this Buddha is infinite and shines on all lands throughout the universe without obstruction. Thus, this Buddha is called Amitabha. When Sariputra remained silent, Sakyamuni Buddha went on to explain Amitabha Buddha's name in terms of infinite light. In the next passage, he spoke of Amitabha's infinite life. Infinite describes that which is innate in the true nature. Infinite wisdom, infinite virtues and abilities and infinite auspicious marks. These three categories of infiniteness cover all the infinities in the entire universe. In these passages from the Sutra, light represents space and life represents time. Thus, infinite light and infinite life encompass all of space, and all of time. They are used here to symbolize all infinities. From the Sutra Also, the lifespan of this Buddha and his people is an infinite number of immeasurable eons. And so he is called Amitabha. Amitabha Buddha attained enlightenment ten eons ago. In this world, to be reborn as a human being is an unbelievably rare opportunity. Such a birth is as rare as a turtle rising from the depths of a vast sea to break through the surface into the center of a solitary wreath of flowers floating on the water. As incredibly rare as this is, far rarer is it to be reborn as a human at a time when a Buddha is teaching the Dharma. We can see this in our world endurance. Almost 3,000 years ago, Sakyamuni Buddha taught in our world for 49 years. He said that the teachings would remain here for 12,000 years. 
this stretch of time would comprise three ages. The Dharma Perfect Age, the Dharma Semblance Age, and the Dharma Ending Age. We have already entered the last age, the Dharma Ending Age, which will continue for 9,000 more years. Sakyamuni Buddha said that when this age comes to a close, the teachings will be lost to us for 5,670 million years, at which time Maitreya Bodhisattva will come to this world. He will come to this Buddha land to become a Buddha and teach us the Dharma. Conversely, in the Pure Land, Amitabha Buddha has been teaching for ten kalpas, or eons, and is still teaching. What's more, he will continue to teach for an incredibly long time because his lifetime is an infinite number of immeasurable eons. Infinity and Asankaya signify particular numbers in the ancient numbering system of India. Just like one million is a specific number today. The Avatamsaka Sutra lists 144 such numerical units, with Asankaya and Infinity among the ten largest. When used in the Sutra, Infinite means a number so inconceivably large that we are incapable of calculating it. Nonetheless, it does represent a given span of time. So even a lifespan of an infinite number of immeasurable eons will eventually end. When Amitabha's lifespan ends and he passes into final nirvana, Avalokiteshvara will become the next Buddha in the Pure Land. Then, after Avalokiteshvara enters final nirvana, Mahasthamaprapta will become the next Buddha. From this, we can see yet another of the inconceivable advantages of being born in the Pure Land. Not only is the environment ideal, but we already know two of the future Buddhas who will continue teaching there when their predecessors enter final nirvana. Knowing who the next two Buddhas in the Pure Land will be assures us of the amazing continuity of the teachings. <laughs>